Where'd you go? Here. Here. Nice. Very nice. All right. Yeah. Nice fist bump from the youth leader. See, that's strong. Strong. You in the back. Where'd you go? Disney World. Disney World. Okay. Let's do two more. You, my man. What was your favorite trip? Canada. Canada. Nice. Home of moose. What's the plural of moose? Is it meese? Meese? That's so jacked up. All right, you right here. Where'd you go? Last one, last one. Be strong, be strong. Dude, epic. Right on. A little soft clap for that guy. Soft clap. Trust me, trust me. Like it, like it, like it. All right, well, uh, I took a trip last summer, all right? And I went to Washington, D.C., okay? Not making this up. Went to Washington, D.C. And let me tell you something. It was awesome because I totally tricked my son on this trip, okay? He thinks that we went there for a reason that I'll tell you in just a minute, but we went there for actually two reasons, all right? And the first one, I was totally scamming, all right? But we turned it into fun. So, pictures please, let's see the first one. Here's where we went. We went to the Capitol building. That is where they make laws that totally destroy our country, okay? That is the Capitol. We stood outside and I wasn't even trying to be political, but apparently you, you agree with me. Okay, so that's there, and we were smiling as our nation burns down. All right, the next picture, we went here. We went to the Smithsonian Institute. If you ever had the chance to go to the Smithsonian Institute, it is like my favorite place because it is awesome and it is free. And when you have five kids, anything that is awesome and free, you're like, dude, get in the van. We are going. We didn't get some ice cream on this trip, yeah. So we went and we looked at all kinds of stuff. There was like stuff I'd seen, stuff I hadn't seen. There was like amazing paintings from people I couldn't even say their names from around the world. I mean, it was off the hook. But that wasn't all because we also went here. How about this? That is the, who knows what that is? The Lincoln Memorial. If you ever get confused, on the penny is the Lincoln Memorial. Who is it named after? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, good. I was really afraid somebody was going to be like, George Washington. Yes. Smoked it. It is. All right. All right, well, we'll pray for that. All right. Next, how about this? This huge thing, who knows what that's called? The Washington Monument. Anybody know the story of how we got that thing? I don't either. Yeah, but it's really awesome. And it's really neat to see. So we were really happy and the sun shined really brightly that day. It kind of burned my records. All right, next. And that is the White House. The White House. You see that little tiny building in the back? We were going to see. Don't you see it? Follow my finger. Look right there, right in the middle, over Nathan's hair. See, right there. Right in the back. We, we were going to get close, but then when I let him know I didn't vote for him, that was as close as we could get. I mean, it's really not. No, I'm kidding. We could have got closer. But the White House won't let you too close. All right? A couple more. How about this? All right. So here we got to see some famous people. If you look between us, you see George Mason. All right? I'm not exactly sure what he did, and all the placards weren't really clear, but he was apparently really important when our country was founded. Okay? But he didn't talk very much when I asked him questions because he's made out of bronze. Remember that when you go to Washington. But he wasn't the only famous person we met because, boom, we also met Thomas Jefferson or at least his head. And he didn't talk very much either because A, it was just his head, and B, he is also made out of bronze. So, note to self, don't ask headless former presidents that are made of metal questions. All right, on we go. How about a couple more? Now here, it got good, all right? You guys don't know this, but I actually had this rare blood sugar disorder where I should never eat ice cream. But when you go on vacation, the disease does not follow you. I don't know if you know follow that. Like the calories don't matter, you just see what you want, and somehow you don't die. It's like magical ponies every day on vacation. All right, on we go. A couple more, a couple more. Oh, this was an art museum we went to, and apparently neither one of us liked this painting. Actually, it was like where the shutter selfie just caught him. He's going to hate me for putting that up there. But anyway, it was fun. All right, and this. This is why we went. All three soccer fans know what's going on here. For you unenlightened Neanderthals, let me explain to you the greatness of soccer. I'm totally kidding. I only cared about soccer starting last year when the World Cup came. Totally jumped on the bandwagon like everybody else. But Nathan loves Manchester United. They really are a great team. 
They were really one of the greatest teams in the history of all soccer teams, and he loves this guy named Wayne Rooney. Wayne Rooney is just a powerful soccer player. He's number 10 for Manchester United. He can kick it from like almost anywhere and score, and Nathan plays a lot like this guy. So we went to D.C. to get to see Manchester United. They came all the way from England. I convinced Nathan they were coming just for him. Actually, I didn't, because I'd be lying and pastors and Christians said lie. But it was awesome, and we got to see him, and they played Inter Milan, which is another big club from the UK, and it went all the way, tied to the end, and then there was PKs, and we won like on the second round of PKs on the next to last shot. And 97,000 of us went completely bonkers. It was awesome. Man, I wish you could have been. But you could, because it was just me and him. And I couldn't take all of you to D.C. because I didn't even know you. But I know this. I have pictures. And dude, pictures are awesome. Pictures help us proclaim things. Because see, if I had told you the story, but I didn't have any pictures, it would just been like, eh. Or if I had pictures that were like of the back of the airplane seat in front of me, and I'd be like, dude, that was dope. Look at that stain from where the baby is. It's just not the same. Or if I had pictures of like the floor of the subway that we rode around, it's just not the same. But when you get a picture that is clear and it shows kind of the essence of what you're there to do, man, the story just comes alive, doesn't it? And see, the Bible is full of pictures. And we have the privilege tonight to pick up in looking at the picture that we started last night in Acts chapter 17. And in this picture, we're going to learn what the Apostle Paul has to say about God. And in tonight's text, he is going to invariably paint a picture for his audience of who God is. And as we zoom in and look at the picture he paints, oh friends, I think it's going to help you proclaim the gospel just like it helped Paul. If you could, stand with me and let's look at this picture together. I'm going to pick up right where I left off. We'll do a little review. We'll be in verses 22 and we're going to go all the way to the end of the chapter in verse 34. Let's hear this. It says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given all assurance by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and the others with them. This God's word. So we have a chunk of text before us, but let me tell you something, friends. It's going to be worth every moment. And I want to 
do just a little bit of review to make sure that we are on the same page. That's why I started in verse 22. You remember yesterday there were four things that we learned that will help us move toward a proclaiming life. First, we have to open our eyes. Second, we have to open our hearts. Third, we have to open our mouths. And fourth, we have to open our minds. And I purposely didn't say as much about that last one last night because we're going to say a lot about it tonight. See, Paul is a master mind opener. He could walk up and assess a situation and not just give a canned presentation. See, there's nothing wrong with memorizing the outline like you're memorizing this week. In fact, I think that is awesome. But if you present that outline exactly the same way to every single person you meet, well, it, it might not go in the way that you hope it goes. See, a good missionary takes the message that never changes and puts it in clothes that change all the time. Great example of this from church history. You should Google this guy at some point. A guy named Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission. He went to China long ago when nobody was going to China as a missionary. And he took on the clothes and the dress. He, he, he immersed himself in Chinese culture. But he kept the gospel the same. And he saw lots of great things happen. See, that's the same thing that Paul is doing here with his proclamation. And that's the same thing that I hope you do. That you take the message that never changes, but you learn to present it in ways that change all the time. And that's what we're going to get to see him do. But see, Paul knew something even larger than that. He knew that even though that contextualization, if you want to call it that, is super, super important, there is something far more fundamental to proclamation of the gospel. And that is a clear picture of who God is and how He works. So if you want to live a proclaiming life, the first thing you've got to pay attention to tonight is that you've got to have a clear picture of who God is and how he works. Let's take a look at this, starting in verse 23 and following. So he says, I found this inscription to the unknown God, and what you worship is unknown, I, this I proclaim to you. So, so what he's done is he's done some recon. He's looked around and he said, okay, I see it. I see all these idols. Boom. These guys are so religious and superstitious that 30,000 gods wasn't enough. They, they kind of made a bonus. Like, like some extra content for their false worship DVD. They just wanted to make sure that they didn't miss one. So they had an idol that literally was basically a catch-all to the unknown God, because we know there's probably another one out there. And Paul says, I want to tell you who he is. Now, who does he begin to say that he is? Look at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. So right there in that one verse, he tells us a whole basket full of truths about God. Let's break them down. The first one, the God who made the world and everything in it. He's telling them that God is the creator. That God made everything. He made the heavens. He made the earth. That is holistic language saying that pretty much anything that could be made God is responsible. So these people, 30,000 gods, idol worshipers, they care a lot about spirituality. He immediately establishes the relevance of the biblical God for them. He is the creator. And since they're already predisposed to want to hear from this God, he stacks the bricks higher. Now what else does he say? He says that he is also Lord of heaven and earth. So, he made the world and everything in it. Now he's Lord of heaven and earth. Now again, we don't hear that word Lord every day, usually unless we are in church or unless we're thinking about like Lord of the Rings or something like that. But it means boss. It means ruler. It means mighty king. It means the one who is in charge. So he is again pushing down the relevance piece for these people. He's doing the same thing for us, friends. So we'll talk more about this in a minute, but I want to make sure that you're tracking with me that the God of the Bible, the God that you say you love, is the Creator, and He's also the Lord. That means that our lives are not our own. That means, as Paul says in another place, that we are to honor God with our bodies because we are not our own. We're bought with a price. 
So if anybody ever wonders, so why is it that it's wrong for me to have any kind of sexual contact outside of marriage? Why is that a big deal? Well, if you're a Christian, it's because your body is not your own. And Jesus says, that's not my best fit for your life. That's out of bounds. That's sinful. So no matter what our culture says, the Lord, the king, the boss, the ruler, the one who owns us, he gets to make the rules. And so in that example and in any other example you could fill in, we need to go with what Jesus says and not what our culture says. And that is what Paul is saying to them. This God that you've made the extra altar for, he's the creator, he's the Lord. And what does he say about him here? He says that he does not live in temples made by man. Now here's why this is a big deal to them. See, every one of their gods, it was geographically anchored to a certain position. If you walk through this area where Paul was, there would literally be a, an idol over here, and then there would be an idol over here, and then there would be an idol back here, and you almost couldn't get around because they wanted to make space for all these idols. They were geographically anchored. They believed that they were responsible for certain plots of land. And Paul comes in and he says, no, 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 no. This God, he's not like your gods. You can't find him out in the sheep pasture. You can't find him in a temple because he's unique. He's not territorially, geographically anchored because he owns it all. And then he goes further. 25, he says, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So what he's saying here is God is not just creator, Lord, and unique among the other gods, but he's also self-sufficient. God doesn't need these people. Now, let me also say this. God doesn't need us people. Now, here's where I want to push on something that some of you might think. I know that sometimes when, when people are starting to think about God and they're starting to ask big questions and say, okay, well, why, why did God create people? And sometimes well-meaning people will say, well, I guess, you know, God was lonely, and so he wanted to have some people so he could fellowship with them. Here's the thing. That might make sense to us, but that's not what the Bible teaches. God, in and of himself, he is one in three. It's called the Trinity. And he had perfect community among himself. So when he created people, he didn't create them because he was like, oh, man, I need some more friends. Holy Spirit, let's make some people so we can like, we'll use them like, like Legos. No, no, that is not what happened with the God of the universe. He created us for his glory, to, to, to show forth his majesty, to proclaim the goodness of his gospel, and to fellowship with him. Because God's not mean and distant and doesn't want to know us. We'll talk about that in the text in just a moment. No, he is transcendent. He's above everything, but he's also imminent. And he wants to be in community with us. But let's also understand this. It says that he's not served by human hands as though he needed anything. And here's where I want us to be careful. Because me, you, all of us, we're made out of the same stuff. And though we might never say something like this, we can get to thinking that God really absolutely has to have us or like the mission is not going to go forward. And we can start thinking things like this. Man, you know what? I took a week off of work, and I went up there to that camp, and those kids kept me up yakking till 4 o'clock in the morning. Man, I tell you, God owes me big. Next time I pray, he better come through. Now listen, some of us in this room, you don't want to admit that, but man, I know you feel that way. And we need to look at a text like this, and we need to say, look, that's just my old man talking. That's my flesh. That's my sin talking. Because the fact is, God doesn't need, need me. I need Him. I, I don't have to serve Him. I get to serve Him. And you say, but Dustin, right there it says, well, we, we don't serve Him. Well, some people do kind of get all bent up about this language. I don't think that when we talk about serving Christ, I don't think we necessarily have to avoid that because of this text. But I think the attitude of thinking that God owes us something and we're a big fat deal for helping Him out, 
we must avoid that attitude. Because God is infinitely great and glorious, and it is a privilege to be called on his mission. And then look at this. He makes it real clear. Why is this? He's talking to these people, and they think, we got to serve these gods. I've got to give this incense. Man, I've got to go give this money. I've got to feed these idols so these, these, they don't like snuff out my kids. And that's what these people believe. And he said, no, 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 you guys got it all wrong. The real God, you don't have to give him something. He gives you everything. So anything you give back to him in response, man, he owns it all anyway. It's just worship. It's, it's honor. It's love back to the God who already loves you. That's the picture Paul is painting. He is writing their picture of God. And I think he's probably doing that for some of us here too. Now, look at this, 26 says this, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, and then pay attention, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So here's the next piece of Paul's picture of God. He is sovereign. Can you say that word with me? He is sovereign. Now that means he is in charge of every area of life. Now, some people hear that and they go, Dustin, man, if God is sovereign over everything, then we're just like robots and we, we have no, we can't make any choices. Our choices don't matter. That's not true. Our choices are real. Our choices do matter. And now smart people have been trying to figure out exactly how people can make real choices and God can be absolutely sovereign. They've been trying to sort that out for hundreds of years and, and guess what? They haven't. And so you and I, we're not going to sort it out tonight. There's a, there's a mystery here of how all this works together. But that's what he's saying here. He's saying, he's so big and strong, he took one guy named Adam, and from that one guy, he made everybody in the world. You talk about a family tree. Man, now that's a family tree. Everybody comes from Adam and Eve. And then on top of that, God, he's not just some guy that went after he created and kind of got the world going. It's like, oh, I'm going to make some other worlds. It's going to kind of mess it up. No, no, no. It says that he's actively involved determining allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. I said this before to you. I'll say it again. Did you know that where you live and when you live has been orchestrated by God? You might say, Dustin, but my parents, they chose to move us to this house. They did. But somehow in the background, kind of like an operating system on your computer, God is working it all out. It's mysterious. It's amazing. It's a sovereign God at work. And Paul is painting the picture for them. Oh, but look at this. I love this. Look at verse 27. You get this word, that. And what that indicates is, I'm about to explain to you why God is doing what he's doing. That's called a purpose clause. And he says here, that they should seek God in hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from any of us. Because sometimes when we hear about the sovereignty of God and we think about how big he is and he's creator and he's Lord and he's self-sufficient, it does make him feel distant. But friends, if that were true, then verse 27 would be a lie. And it's not. He's big and huge and he's near. And he wants to know you. He doesn't just want to know your youth group. He wants to know you. And he wants to know you. And he wants to know you. And he knows how many hairs are growing on your head. And he knows exactly what happened to you when you were 13. And he knows exactly what was going on in your church when you were 7 years old. God knows everything. He's big, but he's close. He's transcendent and he's imminent. And here's where I want to kind of park and ask you some questions. The way that I've talked about God. I'm just trying to paint the picture that Paul was painting for these people. Does this sound like the way that you picture God? Because if not, the Holy Spirit might be wanting to correct some of our pictures today. Because here's what I find as I talk to grown-ups and students. Lots of times people have funny pictures of God. They think of God kind of like Santa Claus. That he's like this pretty jolly old elf. Loves it when you talk to him, when you sit on his knee, when you tell him what you wanted for Christmas. Sometimes you cry in the photo that your family takes. 
But we kind of think about God like that. He's there when we need Him. Show up, tell Him what we want, and then we're back off to our lives. But other people think of God differently. When I talk about God being distant for some of you, that's what you feel like. He's out there. And he's not really involved in my life. And, and you have things happen to you sometimes along the way, really bad things. And you wonder, how in the world can God let this happen? For those of you, you, you kind of look at God as it, kind of your credit card. Man, I'm going to do whatever I want during the year, but dude, I'm going to go to camp and then I'm going to pull out the grace card and I'm just going to pray and cry and then dude, I'm going to go right back till next year and then I come back and do it again. Friends, we don't have time for this time, but the Bible has very strong words for people who think like that. And here's what I hope is happening right now in this room. That if we sit under this scripture together, the Holy Spirit is changing our picture of God and making it more biblical. He is creator. He is Lord. He is sovereign. He is self-sufficient. But he's near. And he wants to know you. And if you want to proclaim the gospel, and you want it to be from the Bible, that's the kind of God we need to be telling people about. Let's look on. Second thing, verses 28 and 29. If you want to live a proclaiming life, then you have to learn to speak about God in a way people understand. Now watch this. This is fascinating. Look what Paul does here. He says, for, and then you'll notice if you got a Bible, quotes, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. And then more quotes. For we are indeed his offspring. Now you, you talk about an open-minded missionary right here. This, this is going to melt some of your brains. What Paul is doing is that he is actually taking two quotes, two psalms, I believe. One from a cat named Epimenides, which is a tough name on the playground, I'm just saying. And the second from a guy named Eretus. And they were basically pagan worship songs. All right, So we sing real worship songs in here to Jesus. But these were songs to false gods. And so Paul takes those songs and he says, hey, I'm going to reclaim some of this. And he uses these songs that the people would have immediately known and connected with. They might have even sung them that morning. And he repurposes them, and he is about to just drop it on them that the God that they were singing to, it actually wasn't these false gods. It was the real God who really is these things. Look at verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So here's what Paul does that is so great. All of us proclaimers in this room, and we need to lay into this. You start where people are, but you don't leave them where they are. Start where they are, but don't leave them where they are. Because well, this would have been a different story if Paul was like, yeah, that pagan worship song, I love it. Okay, let's talk about something else. That's not helpful. Those people are still worshiping false gods, still headed for hell. He reclaims it, repurposes it, and turns it into the gospel. So not only does he contextualize, but he contends. Contextualizing, he talks about again, if you want to do some Bible study later, 1 Corinthians 9, and he contends, like Jude says in Jude 3. He is hanging on to the truth. And let me give you just a couple of practical words here that will help you do this when you go back home. The first thing you got to think is, I need to think about the way that I talk about the gospel to other people. I need to think about it. And here's what I mean. It's not necessarily one size fits all. Now listen, you go to innovating the gospel and not communicating the gospel, you become a heretic. That's a problem. But you need to think about how you present it. I'll give you a quick example. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. This was probably, gosh, 15 years ago. I was out sharing my faith, walking down the street. I see a guy sitting on the curb. He is crying. I walk over to him and start talking. Turns out the guy is a veteran. We start talking about the gospel. And what he kept saying to me is, I just can't believe that God would love me because of all the people I killed in Vietnam. Now, to that guy, I didn't have to stress sin and judgment and wrath. Dude, he got it. He was crying when I got there. So what I emphasized to him 
was grace and mercy and forgiveness. And bro, God can forgive you no matter what you've done. But there are other people that I talk to, far more in this camp, who don't think they're sinners at all. And we've got to work through it and help them understand. But in both cases, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to assess the situation. I'm trying to think about my language. And I'm trying to put it in a way where I start where they are, but I don't leave them where they are. Friends, you can do that too. I don't have any magic. You can do that too. Think about what you say and how you say it. Next thing I'd say very practically is you've got to learn to turn the corner. You've got to learn to turn the corner. See, some of us are really good at connecting with people, but it's like having the Jesus talk that's hard. And listen, that, that is hard. And we need to pray that God would help us, but we need to go back later when I'm not here and look at this passage again and look at how Paul does it. Start where they are, but don't leave them where they are. How does he do it? What do you have available? What, what are some of the, the hurts in your town? Has your town got a meth problem? It might, if you're in this region. How can you take the gospel to people who are entrapped in that lifestyle? Your school, has your school got a drug problem? It probably does. How can you take the gospel to people who think that smoking weed is no big deal? See, you've got to think like Paul thought. How can we take this message that doesn't change and bring it into these changeable situations? Learn to turn that corner. And when you do, something awesome is going to happen. Verses 30 and 31 give us the next principle. Paul was a master of this. So if you want to learn, lead a proclaiming life, part of what you've got to do is you've got to learn to tell the whole story. See, Paul is not just like, oh, let's repurpose these worship songs. Listen, look what he does. He says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Remember that? 180, turn and here's why. I love that Paul explains what he's talking about. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and has given all assurance by raising him from the dead. Now, you look at this and you're like, yeah, that's pretty much Christianity. This would have melted their brains. Because he's talking about judgment. And guess what he's talking about? Right in front of a bunch of judges. This language is purposeful. See, the Areopagus was a group of 30 guys that got to decide whose idol got set up. Remember, we talked about this. And he's basically saying, look, 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 you guys got it all wrong. See, you sit here as judge and jury, but I need to tell you that the real God, he's going to judge you. And in the past, he overlooked what you've been up to. But now that Jesus has come and he is resurrected to prove that this is all legit, you are going to be held accountable for this. And you need to repent of your sin. See, he's not afraid to tell the whole story. And friends, if we want to be true proclaimers, we can't be afraid to tell the whole story either. You do not need to be ashamed or afraid to tell people both that God loves them and that if they don't repent, they are going to hell. Both of those pieces are true. And sometimes we're so quick to tell people that God loves them that we kind of don't even mention that there's penalty if they don't embrace it. Friends, we've got to hold these truths together. Paul was a wonderful example of that. He told the whole story. And then finally, I love, I love, love, love how this passage wraps up. 32 to 34, he shows us the reality of what proclaiming looks like. And friends, if we want to live a proclaiming life, we have to know that there will always be a variety of responses to our proclamation. Let's read this. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. That's a strong word. They made fun of him publicly in the midst of this crowd. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some joined him and believed among whom were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Friends, what a great picture of what real gospel ministry looks like. There's going to be some people that you talk to, hey, they're going to make fun of you. I won't sugarcoat them. They're going to think you're stupid for believing in the God that Paul draws a picture from us. Always has been, 
always guilty. They made fun of Jesus. And the Bible says no servant is above his master. We just need to know what going in. If you want to proclaim, there's going to be some haters. That's just the truth. But there will also be people who want to talk more about it. They might not say it just like this, but they will say, hey, you know what? I want to talk more about this. Maybe it's not really my thing now, but you know what? They're open to discussing it. There will be people like that in your life. And then also, there will be people that when you proclaim the good news to them, guess what's going to happen? They are going to get saved. You know how I know this? Because I got saved. And you got saved. And because you became a Christian. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not a suggestion. It's not an idea. It is dynamite that blows dead people to life. And friends, there will be people that when we preach the gospel to them, even if it takes nine times, which is what a lot of research says today, they will cross from death unto life. That's amazing to me. That the Creator God, who is Lord of heaven and earth, who is self-sufficient, but He's still near, would save a guy like Paul, that he would save a guy like Dustin, that he would save people like you and put us on a mission to proclaim. And be so kind to tell us that there's always going to be a variety of responses. So here's the way I want to close tonight. I want to ask you, what is your response to the gospel? Who are you going to be in this passage? Are you going to be the mockers? Are you going to be the people that are like, that's not for me, man, that's stupid. Are you going to be the person that says, you know what, I get it, but man, I want to hear more about it before I buy in. Or will you be the person, just like these people, that believe in Jesus? They put their faith and trust in Him. And friend, this is my hope. I hope you're in that last category. Worship band, you guys come on up. And tonight, we have the opportunity for you to come into that last category. Some of you, you've been hearing us talk about the gospel every day, all day long. You've been hearing me preach about the gospel every night that we've been here. And you've been sitting both literally and figuratively on the edge of your seat every night when I give people an opportunity to respond. Because you just don't know. But friend, let me say this to you again. The gospel is true. The God that we saw the picture of tonight, He is real. And He wants to know you. And if you put your faith and trust in the perfect life and the substitute's death and the glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, He will save you. He will save you. For all of us, let me ask you to bow your head. Let's focus just for a few moments. And let's enter into this time of reflection and response. If you would say, Dustin, through what we've been talking about, I now realize that I am separated from God. And I want to know Him. If the Lord is calling you to Himself tonight, would you be bold? And would you stand? Right now, right where you are, you would say, I know that I don't know Jesus, and I want to know Him, and I want to know Him tonight. Just stand up. If you would say this, you would say, you know what? I'm still not sure exactly where I stand with God. I still wonder, am I really a Christian? If that's where you're at tonight, would you stand right now so that your youth leader can see who you are? Lots of people are in that camp. People who would just say, look, man, I, I just don't know. I don't know where I'm at. Youth leaders, if you guys could be watching out for these precious folk. Anybody else? guys who just stood up, let me give you a challenge. Hopefully your youth leader saw you, but let me ask you to be bold, just in case they didn't. 
after we finish up tonight, will you go to them and say, hey, I don't know if you saw me, but man, I, I really don't know where I'm at with God. Can you help me sort that out? I would encourage you to do that. Now, next group. This morning, in our large groups, we drew some circles. And we put people in our home, we put people in our school, we put people in our town, we put people in the nations in those circles. For some of you, that's probably the first time you've ever thought about doing something like that. Let me connect that to the passage that we just looked at. God has put you where you are for a reason. You're not in that home, you're not in that school, you're not in that town, you're not in this nation by accident. You are here for a reason. And I wonder tonight, has God placed anybody specific on your heart to be praying for? And instead of you standing up right now in this moment, I just want, I just want you to pray for them. Just pray for those people that are on your hearts. Pray for those names because they're not just names. They are souls. And they are going to spend eternity somewhere, either with Jesus or not. And let's just lift them to the Lord. As you're doing that, let me also encourage you to lift somebody else to the Lord. Lift yourself to the Lord. Because you're the missionary that is stationed in their life. You've been commissioned by Jesus to do what you can to share with them. Pray for yourself. Pray that you'd have boldness. Pray that you do the kind of things that we talked about tonight. Pray that God would give you courage. Pray that you look for opportunities just like Paul did. Next group of folks, maybe you would say, you know what? I am a Christian. I want to proclaim. But if I'm honest, the reason I don't is because I know that I am living two different lives. And I don't want to be seen as a hypocrite, so I keep my mouth shut. Let me give you this encouragement and this challenge tonight. If that's you and you know your life is filled with junk and you haven't dealt with that, you haven't brought that darkness out into the light. Can I ask you to be bold right now and have you stand just as a, a, a public stake in the ground to say, you know what? I just I don't want to be this way. I don't want to live this double life. Your youth leaders aren't going to judge you. They're going to help you. They're going to walk with you. Anybody else? I want to pray for you guys. Lord, I pray for these people that are responding to the conviction of the Spirit to bring their life and their speech in line. Lord, I pray that Jesus would become so precious to them that whatever sins they are entangled in, it would just seem ridiculous to keep walking down that path since they belong to you. Lord, I pray for courage for them to go to their leaders tonight and to talk about it. You guys can have a seat. Last group. This would be only for people who have not stood up when I've asked this question earlier this week. But if you would say, you know what? Man, I can't even explain it all. I don't even know what all this means. But thus, when you talk about devoting your life in a full-time way to sharing the gospel. I, I don't know what that means. I don't know if I'd be a music pastor or a youth pastor or a senior pastor or being a missionary. I don't know what that might mean. But you sense that the Lord might be prompting you to move toward ministry in some way. And you've not stood up for that this week. Would you be bold and stand up tonight? Again, not to be pointed out or to be judged in any way but just so your youth leaders can know who you are. You don't have to have all the answers now. We just want to start a conversation. Thank you, guys. Anybody else? All right, well, let's do this. I'm going to pray, then we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to move through the rest of our evening. Lord, I thank you that you give us your word. 
And when the word goes out, it does not return void. And Lord, it is obvious that you are at work in many people's lives. Those who stood and those who didn't. You're at work in our lives. Lord, I pray that as people have responded tonight, that this would be a very important step in their spiritual journey. And that they would know your love, that they would know your care, and that they would know it through the camp staff, that they would know it through the youth leaders, and they would know it through the music, through the fun, through all that's happened this week, and that they would know it through your spirit as we lead to We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me if you could sing this together.